start the recording so also welcome back for everyone on youtube um and on moodle of course if you can't watch it live yes token for all is still awake good 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 so i'm not doing this just by myself so we'll go through the overview so um that's it for the whole lecture series most waiting for one of the most important parts of the lecture what's the most important part the, the overview <laughs> could be, but uh, it's just going through the old lectures and just highlighting what I think is important. So, all right, let's go then. So what do you need to study? Everything on the slides, as well as the PDF um, about the mixed models. So of course there's a lot of slides and not everything is as important, but remember that if I feel really sneaky, I could come up with really difficult questions about some of the slides. So if it's not on this slide, it doesn't mention that it's, it, it doesn't mean that it's not on the exam. It's just less likely to be on the exam. But everything on the slides is fair game. So just read the slides and, um, read the PDF. Uh, there will be at least one question about the PDF, just to make sure that you guys read it. Um, so lecture one, um, we had a short overview of history. Um, there will definitely be a question about history. I like history. Um, so uh, we talked about things like the Ankitera mechanism, about computers, um, uh, about famous people in computer science, like uh, people like, uh, Ada Lovelace. Um, yeah, so know the people, know what they did, know what the first computer was, um, and these kinds of things. There will probably be like one or two warm-up questions um, that just ask some um, history about computers or history about famous people in computer science. Uh, why are? Uh, there's a slide that mentions like seven different reasons why you want to use R, right? It's a, it's a good programming language. It has built-in graphics. It has built-in linear models and statistics. Um, it has a difference between factors and numeric values. Um, and it, it can deal with matrices and, and, and vectors very easily. Um, so there will probably be a question like name three reasons why you should use R. And again, I can't stress this enough. If I am asking for three reasons, you can mention one reason, two reasons, or three reasons, but not four reasons. So there, the number mentioned in the question is always the upper bound. Don't go over it because then the whole answer is wrong. So just just to be extra clear about that. Um, it, we talked about using R as a calculator, so be aware that something like Euc Euclidean division exists, right? Euclidean division is just how many times does a number fit wholly into another number, right? So 22 and 7, 7 fits 3 times in 22, and then there is one remainder left, because 3 times 7 is 21, and, and then we still have one um, thing left, so one item left, which we could not distribute. Know about the built-in constants. So you have months, that abbreviation, you have the, the years and, and these kinds of things. So there's a lot of built-in constants in R. Um, so if there's a question like, how is the built-in constant for pi called? Um, then you have to say, well, this is pi with a capital P. Uh, we talked about data types um, and we did the little quiz in the first lecture, right? Where you guys get to shout numeric character factor. Um, that will definitely be in the exam. I like making questions like that, where I try to trick you guys as much as I can. Um, and you have to kind of see through all of the things in the question and say, well, this is going to lead to a numeric value. Um, furthermore, indexing of vectors and matrices happens by square brackets. Um, and in matrices, the first element that you specify is the row and the second element is the column. And this, of course, is very similar to the apply function, where the margin of one means the rows and the margin of two means the columns. So it, it is very consistent. Um, we also talked a little bit about variables, so know what a variable is and how you can use it. 
lecture two, we talked more about variables and then also we started talking about control structures. So be able to write like a little if statement, right? If I say write an if statement to compare if a number is higher than 25 and lower than 75, and then you have to be able to write down saying if x smaller or larger than 25 and yeah, so ampersand ampersand x smaller than 75. Um, Know that the switch statement is a very similar statement to the if statement, but that the switch allows you to switch on, on multiple things, right? So if numeric, if character, if in, in one statement. Um, furthermore, we have the while loop and the for loop. Um, so both of them loop, um, but the nice thing about the while loop is, is that you don't have to know how often it loops. The for loop, you have to know beforehand, how many rows of the matrix there are or how many columns there are, right? Then you can use a for loop because you're starting from one to something or from a hundred to something. Um, but if you don't know how often something needs to occur, then you're forced to use a while loop. Like we saw, for example, in the question um, with the, um, uh, with the Fibonacci numbers. Right, we don't know when the Fibonacci numbers are going to be bigger than a million, so we can't use a for loop. We have to say while the number is smaller than a million, continue, otherwise stop. Right. So the nice thing about a for loop is is that you can use it, and it's very easy, and it's easier to write than a while loop. But the limitation of a for loop is that beforehand you need to know how often you are going to go through the loop. Well, for a while loop, you have no such restriction. Know what the difference is between a statement and an expression. So an expression is something which um, assigns something to a variable, while a statement is something that evaluates to true or false, right? It's if statement, do expression, right? So if x smaller than 100, um, yeah, so then x smaller than 100 is the statement. And then the expression might be, well, if it's smaller than 100, add 100. So x is x plus 100, right? And that is then an expression. We talked about a little bit in lecture two already about advanced looping. So know how to write an apply function. And also know that apply one means apply to the rows and then apply two means apply to the columns. And so that the, the, the margin, the parameter called margin is specifying which dimension you want to apply to. We have L apply for when we want to apply to a list, for example, select, uh, like we saw, select the third element uh, for each element of the list. We talked about functions, about a little bit about theory about functions and about scope, and that you should not read, um, and that everything which you need for a function to work should be an input parameter. Um, a function is only allowed to return one thing, um, and some other things about scope where we said, well, if you have a big variable in your R session, then it is sometimes okay to refer to this directly from within the variable or for, from within the function, but generally you don't want to do that. Generally you want to have a function being a self-contained unit, meaning that you never reference a variable, which is not an input variable of the function. We talked about escaping. So escaping is the process on which you use the backslash to print, for example, a backslash in a character, right? So if I have a, a character string, then sometimes I need to use the, the enter key, which is slash N. Um, sometimes I want to include a tab, which is slash T. Um, and had these things um, always make for fun questions. So there will definitely be a sentence that you guys need to escape um, so that you can write this to uh, a file. Um, we talked a little bit about randomness in lecture number two. So randomness, um, know that I can use R unif for uniform in, uh, for random numbers from a uniform distribution. I can use R norm for random numbers from a normal distribution and I can use R poise for random numbers from a Poisson distribution. And also know to give an example of a distribution, right? So if I ask you guys, what is the classical example of a normal distribution, um, then you guys have to say, well, it's when you throw darts at a dartboard, 
right? Because if you throw darts at a dartboard, you're always aiming for the middle, but you're not always hitting the middle. So you get kind of a normal distribution um, around the bullseye, right? Most of the arrows will be relatively close to the bullseye, but some of them will be spread further apart. And of course, if I'm randomly throwing a thousand arrows at a dartboard, um, then these will kind of spread out in a normal distribution. Um, and for each of these, we had an example in, in lecture number two. Lecture number three is about reading data. So know that there is a function called read table, also read comma separated file. Um, here, the main thing is that you know most of the parameters, right? So how to set a separator, um, how to set the decimal point, um, how to specify that there's a header or that there are row names in column number three. Furthermore, we have, of course, the read lines and the read bin function. So read lines allows you to just read lines from a file. So, hey, if you don't have a comma separated file, but just something like lore ipsum, uh, yeah, so just some text or some text from a book like the Bible, um, you can read that in using read lines. Um, if you want to read binary files like uh, BMP files, we had the example of how to use the read bin function to read binary files. Also in lecture three, we have subsetting of data. So know how to use the in statement and the which. Yeah, so like selecting three columns from a matrix. You can use column names of the matrix in, and then you specify the three column names that you want. Um, also know how to use the subset function. So yeah, that you can use subset of the matrix and then say, uh, column number five needs to be lower than than four, um, and then select column number one and, and 17 from the matrix. Yeah, so the subset function allows you to make subsets of your data, um, which can be really useful um, depending on what you want to do. Writing data can, of course, be done by the write table function, but you can also use the cut function. So the cut function directly prints to a file and allows you to put other data than matrices in, in, a, in a file, while the write table is really focused on writing a, a table, so a two-dimensional structure. In lecture three, we also talked about Biomart. So Biomart is this connector tool, which allows you to directly query um, biological databases from R. Um, and it has a certain amount of concepts, like what is a Mart? So a Mart is a connection to a database. An attribute is something that you can retrieve from the database. A filter is something that it allows you to specify what you are going to give to the database for searching. And values are then elements that you are searching for, right? So an attribute that I might want to retrieve might be, is this gene on the positive strand or on the negative strand? The filter that I'm going to use might be gene name. And then the value might be, BBS7 as the gene that I want to search for. So three different um, terms or terminology. Know the terminology and know what the difference is between an attribute, a filter, and a value. In lecture number four, we talked about univariate versus bivariate analysis, and we had a whole bunch of examples of uh, univariate more or less statistics or um, cancel. Um, so have we talked about central tendencies? Uh, what is the mean? What is the median? What is the mode? Um, when we are computing the mean, know that there are three different types of mean, like the, the, the arithmetic mean, uh, the subcontrary mean, and, and the harmonic mean. We talked about dispersion. So what is the range of the data? What are the different quantiles? Um, we talked a little bit about spread, like variance and standard deviation. And we talked about shape, especially in the context of a normal or a Gaussian distribution. So and know when a, when a normal distribution is skewed um, and that kurtosis is uh, kind of the squeezing or the, the pulling of the, uh, of the normal distribution, right? So if I have a normal distribution and I, 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 I press it down like that, I'm, I'm making a platykurtic normal distribution, while if I'm pulling it up, then it's, it's leptokurtic, because then it has kind of positive, um, it, it's, it's too high in the middle. We also talked about plots here, so how you can do a box plot, a histogram, or an image, if you want to have a 2D plot, like a heat map kind of plot. Um, and here also we talked about the PAR, 
So PAR allows you to set all kinds of plotting options like the margin, um, the text, uh, the font size, and, and the, the font family and these kinds of things. Furthermore, in lecture number five, we talked about the classes of objects and that you can define something which is called an S3 class and that you can have default functions when you make your own objects, right? So I can, I can use this attribute or uh, the attribute class of uh, a variable to make this variable special, right? To, to give this variable its own kind of summary function or its own print function or its own plot function. Um, and this is very useful when you are designing packages because then you generally make kind of a custom data structure hey, where in, for example, you make a list and in the first element of the list, you store the genotypes. And then in the second element of the list, you have all of the, the phenotypic values. And then in item number three of the list, there is a list or a matrix, which has all of the different covariates, right? And then if this, hey, if you then assign a class to this object, then you can use it to define a custom plot function. So when I call plot on my own object that I just created, um, then instead of calling the standard plot functions, it will call my plot function so that it, it just looks better. Know that when we are plotting, that we are following the artist palette model, right? So we start off with an empty canvas and then we add things to that canvas one by one. So have we, for example, do some dots and then we do some lines and then we do some arrows, uh, but this all goes from the back to the front. So everything is over plotted like someone painting, right? The, you paint the background and then you, you do a little bit in the foreground and then a little bit further in the foreground. So it's very similar to the Bob Ross paintings um, going from the back all the way to the front. And R works the same way. In lecture number five, we also talked about important plot parameters like um, CEX, PCH. And so for the magnification and the, the type of point that you're using, um, we also talked about different functions that are related to plotting, like adding lines and points and text and titles and axes. Um, we also talk very quickly about the width function. So the width function allows you to take a matrix and then instead of having to say matrix, square bracket open, comma, name of the column, square bracket close, you can say width matrix and then you can directly use the column name as if it were a variable. We also talked a little bit about what makes a good plot. So if you think about a plot, then it should of course have a description on the X axis and on the Y axis. It should mention units. Um, every symbol in the plot needs to have an explanation. There needs to be a main, so a, a title to the plot. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of little rules when you make a plot for publication. Um, and remember that in R, you generally make two plots. You make one for publication on paper and you make a plot for lectures um, or uh, PDFs um, and those have different requirements because it, things that you can do on a, on a publication you can sometimes not do on, on, a, on a PowerPoint presentation just because of the colors not printing well um, or the other way around. All right, in lecture six, we talked about the common microarray workflow, right? So that we had, that we start off by extracting RNA, then we make DNA from it, and then hey, we, we add colors like Psi3 and Psi5, then we put all of this into a machine that scans the intensities of the different colors, and then we do steps like normalization, and so where we then make sure that the average of every microarray is the same, um, just so that we can compare between microarrays that have been done on different days. And hey, of course, normalization is there to get rid of unwanted variants um, that might occur because of different temperatures or other little factors which change. We talked about log ratios. So a log ratio is, of course, hey, when you have uh, um, an intensity of the green channel divided by the intensity of the red channel, and then you take the log two of that, um, to make sure that when you take uh, a step of one unit up, that that is the same step as going one unit down, right? Because uh, two divided by one is two, and one divided by two is half. And of course, these are not symmetrical, right? Going from one to two is a bigger step than going from one to half. And you can take the log two to prevent this from happening. So by taking the log two, you go from one becomes zero, 
half becomes minus one and two becomes positive one. So now it's symmetrical again, because now if you step from one to two, so from zero to one, you have a step of one. And if you stop from a step from one to half, you have a step of minus a half, but in logarithmic terms, you have a step of minus one. So and the, the log ratios allow you to um, have a symmet symmetrical distribution on the top as well as on the bottom. We talked about t-tests and the assumptions underlying a t-test, right? So that both distributions are a normal distribution and that both of the um, uh, uh, that that both of the groups have the equal variance. And I also showed you how to uh, change this. So hey, if you don't have equal variance, you can do a Wells t-test. If you have equal variances, then you can do the student t-test and that just works by specifying different parameters. Um, next slide in Dutch. All right, that will probably be one of the last slides I do in Dutch, so that's good. Uh, I, we talked about correlation. So what is correlation? Um, what is the difference between Pearson correlation and Spearman correlation? And so Pearson correlation has the assumption that it is a normal distribution, while Spearman correlation does not have the normal distribution assumption. It just, it uses the rank of the numbers to do the computation. Um, we talked about multiple testing. So yeah, because we always want to be certain about the things that we say in statistics, or at least we want to be 95% certain, we need to compensate for this fact when we do hundreds or tens of thousands of tests as is common in microarrays, right? With a microarray, you measure 20,000 genes in a genome. So when we do a standard t-test, then of course, we would have many false positives if we would not correct for multiple testing. So we talked about type one errors um, where you say that something is different. Uh, no, a type one errors when you say that something is not different, but it is, while a type 2 error is when you say that something is not different, while it is. Anyway, just look it up on the slides. Type 1 and type 2 errors know the difference. Type 1 errors can be uh, prevented using Bonferroni correction. Type 2 errors can be prevented using benjamin hoogberg correction. Um, and also, there are two sources of free microarray data mentioned in, in lecture six. Um, so I might ask you guys about where you can get free microarray data in case you want to analyze some free data. Okay, so um, collision number seven ging over algoritmes. So uh, algoritmes um, is is a uh, coke recept, and you voer elke stap uit. So, and het mooie aan een algoritme is dat je, dat je hebt een, een beginstaat en dan heb je een heel aantal stappen en uiteindelijk kom je in de eindstaat en daar kom je ook altijd. Dus een algoritme is een kookrecept en als je de stappen volgt, dan kom je altijd bij het antwoord. En dit antwoord is altijd valide. Um, daarnaast hebben we ook over design patterns gepraat en design patterns zijn... Algoritmes die heel vaak gebruikt zijn al door heel veel mensen. En daarom is het kind of de, de standaard probleemaanpak geworden. He, omdat bijvoorbeeld hoe log ik in op een website. Uh, dat is iets wat honderdduizenden keren gedaan is door tienduizenden verschillende programmeurs. He, dus we weten ondertussen precies hoe jij het login op een website moet regelen. Uh, daarnaast hebben we ook over functies gepraat. Dus we hebben gepraat over wat recursie is. Dus recursie is een functie die zichzelf aanroept. Als we recursie hebben, hebben we een invariant nodig. En een invariant is iets wat uh, continu omhoog gaat of continu naar beneden gaat. En uiteindelijk raakt de invariant de base case. Dus de base case is de, is de, is de situatie waarin we het antwoord direct weten. Um, en het, daarnaast met recursie gaan we normaal een iteratief proces in, uh, waarin we zeggen van nou, als we x is 0 weten, um, wat, hoe komen we nou bij x is 0 als we x plus 1 hebben? Ja, en als we x plus 2 hebben, hoe komen we dan bij x plus 1? He, dus we gaan altijd met de invariant, gaan we altijd van bijvoorbeeld 100 naar beneden, of we gaan van 100 omhoog, uh, maar we stoppen altijd wanneer we de base case bereikt hebben. Dus de... de, de de, de, de positie waarin we precies weten van, oh, nou is het antwoord 1 of 2 of 3. Maar dat er dus een fixed antwoord is. 
Indirecte recursie hebben we het ook over gehad. En indirecte recursie is wanneer jij een functie hebt die een andere functie aanroept, die op zijn beurt weer de originele functie aanroept. He, dus dan, dan heb je nog steeds de, de functie die zichzelf aanroept, maar dat gebeurt niet direct, maar dat gebeurt indirect door middel van een andere functie. Alright, so in, in English, so in lecture 7 we talked about algorithms, so algorithms are a cooking recipe, um, and they start, and so a cooking recipe is something where you have a, a starting position, then you have a, a fixed amount of steps, and then you end up in a final state. And if you follow the algorithm, you always end up in the same final state. So you start off with the same beginning state, and then you take the exact same step. So it's just following a certain cooking recipe. And there's a lot of these algorithms out there. And when an algorithm is used by a lot of people, then we call it a design pattern. So a design pattern is nothing but a solved uh, problem, right? So a solved problem can be how to log in to a website. There have been literally hundreds of thousands of people who thought about it. And of course, nowadays, we just have a standard approach on how to log into a website. And this is then called a design pattern. So it's not a algorithm in the sense that it is written down in a programming language, but it's more a systematic approach on how would you implement this in a programming language, um, for example, logging to a website. We also talked about functions, like what is recursion? Um, so recursion is a function calling itself. When we do recursion, we have something which is called the recursion invariant. And the recursion invariant is the thing that always goes up or goes down towards the base case. So the base case is the case where, for example, x is zero, so we directly know y, right? So we, 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 we have, an answer when this is our input and then recursion is nothing more than kind of an iterative process saying well if we know the answer to x how do we now go from x plus one back to x or how do we go from x plus two to x plus one to x right and that's this is what the invariant does the invariant always gradually increases towards the base case or it always gradually decreases from where we start down to the base case. And as soon as it hits the base case, it will kind of walk up the stack, count up all of the things that we need, and it will give us the answer. Indirect recursion is the same thing as recursion. It's just when you have an intermediate function, right? We have function one calling function two, and function two calls function one again. So it is recursing, right? Because we call the same function again, but there's an indirect step because it doesn't directly call itself, but indirectly. And that's why it's called indirect recursion. So in lecture number eight, we talked a lot about how to create your own R package. I still think this is one of the most useful skills that you can have as an R programmer um, because it, it generally leads to a lot of kind of shared author publications and where you can just say, well, you wrote the code, I will write the package, and then we will publish a really nice software paper besides the analysis paper that you already published. So what do you need to create a package? Well, be aware that you need to have R and if you're on Windows that you need R tools. Um, besides that, everything is about structure. Right, it, it, It's just a folder where you have a certain um, name of the folder and then a certain type of file going in there. Right, So you have the MAN folder for manuals, you have the R folder for R scripts, uh, you have the data folder for data and the SRC folder for external scripts like uh, C or C++ or Fortran. Um, know that there are two required files. You have to have a description file describing your package. Right? What is the name, which version are you using, and who are you, who's the author. And you have the namespace, and the namespace file is kind of the file which tells R which functions are exported by my package. So which functions and are, is my package offering to the user. Um, besides that, you have a couple of special files. So you have the your package name minus package.r data, which is kind of the global help file, right, the entry point to the help. Um, and then you have the internal file, which lists all of the internal functions. So those are functions which are required by your package, but which you generally not be called by the user of the package. So things which you use internally, but the user should not use because the user should just use the provided functions. 
In lecture nine, we talked about regression. We've been talking a lot about regression, but have we talked about what is a regression model? What are the different variables in this model? So have, what, what regression is, is getting an estimate for these unknown parameters, also known as beta. These betas belong to the uh, independent variables, right? So if I have five independent variables, x1 to x5, then I will be estimating five different betas as well. Um, so the x, the predictor, is called the independent variable, and the response is called the dependent variable, and the response is the phenotype or thing that we are interested in, while the x are either nuisance variables, in which we are not interested in, but we need to compensate for it, or it is the variables that we have measured and we now want to see if they are predictive of y. So we talked about single linear regression, and then I also showed you guys how you can calculate your confidence interval yourself, and that you can use like the FISREG package to do uh, a visualization of the 95% confidence interval. But we also talked about um, hey, creating some plots showing regression ourselves, um, where we do like the upline in the in in the plot, and um, also how to visualize things like residuals. Um, we also talked a little bit in lecture nine about multiple linear regression. That is just when you have more than one X. So you have X1, X2, and X3 measured. And for example, I want to compensate for the height, the body weight, the length of their ears, and the number of tails that someone has. Um, and then we are doing multiple linear regression where we have multiple of these independent variables um, explaining or kind of combined predicting our dependent variable. And I also talked how to do quadratic regression in R. Um, remember that you have to use the I, the capital I identity function around, uh, around quadratic and, and other arguments, right? So if I have an argument time to the power of two, so then I type time um, and then the roof, the accent IQ, and then two, but I have to surround this with this capital I for making or telling the regression that this is a quadratic term um, and not just to do the things to power of two and then use that. In lecture 10, we have the linear mixed effect analysis. So know what a random effect is, know why we should do mixed effect analysis. This is of course because power in regression only comes from independent measurement. So measuring the same individual 20 times does not give you additional statistical power. So you can use a mixed effect model to kind of bring this structure into your analysis. So if your analysis is having, for example, 10 individuals which are repeatedly measured about five times across different time points, then you, can, then you have to use linear mixed effect analysis to tell the model that there is groups in your data. So groups which are not independent from each other. For example, I have measured time series data or I have the same individual measured 10 times. Um, so I told you guys how to do that in R, also how to get the significant. And of course, we talked a little bit about what the difference is between a random intercept model, where each group is allowed to have their own intercept with the uh, x-axis, right? So the x-axis where x is, are to have their own intercept with the y-axis. So at the position where x is zero, every group is now allowed to have their own mean. Uh, for example, in mice, I always think about when mice are born, then the total amount of weight is more or less a constant, right? A mouse can give birth to around 10 grams of new mice. But of course, if it only gets five babies, every baby will be two grams, right? So then every individual has an intercept of two at time point zero. While if the mouse only got three babies, then of course, all of these three babies on average are like 3.3 grams. So they are allowed to have their own uh, intercept. So at x equals zero, the y's are allowed to vary. We also talked about the random slope model, and the random slope model is, is different in that sense, is that every group is allowed to have their own kind of uh, own, own kind of beta, right? So not the intercept is different for each group, but the beta for each group might be different. For example, have Females might have a wider range of voice than males. Um, and of course, that, that then leads to a different slope. 
uh, when you have multiple questions in, in different tones. Um, so I know to know how these models are written down, know what the idea behind a mixed effect analysis is, and know that that the mixed effect analysis is there to tell the model that no, I don't have a thousand measurements, independent measurements. I only have 200 measurements or 200 independent data points, which are measured five times, right? And in the end, I still have then a thousand measurements, but there is a grouping. So yeah, five measurements belong to a single individual. And of course, be aware that the PDF is part of this lecture. And then the last lecture, which we had today, um, know the difference between linear models, right? So that's lecture nine, LMERs, that's lecture 10. And then today we had GLMs. So a GLM is a standard linear model, but now the response doesn't have to be a continuous normal distribution. So it can also be a binary variable saying yeah, healthy, sick, or pass, fail. Right, uh, Or we can use a Poisson distribution where we say we've measured the amount of bees on a flower. Yeah, often there's zero, also often there's one, but then sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three, and almost never there's five bees on a single flower. Right, So yeah, the, the, the GLM function allows you to have response variables of a different type. So continuous versus... Um, versus uh, counted data versus binary zero one. I told you about the vault test. So the vault test in a GLM allows you to summarize multiple uh, effects into a single p-value um, yeah, because if you do a GLM, then the factor variable gets treated more or less like in independent beta. So every beta gets its own p-value but often you want to know what is the combined effect of all of these different groups. And then you can use a vault test to group multiple um, uh, coefficients, multiple beta coefficients uh, together to get a single p-value on how the group of measurements or how the group of or the levels um, combined influence the result. I told you about melting versus casting. So going from wide format to long format and going from long format to wide format. Um, and going from wide to long is called melting and going from long to wide is called casting. Um, and be able to recognize a matrix as well, right? So if I give you a matrix with five columns, um, know to recognize if it is in long format or if it is in wide format. And of course, know the idioms that we talked about. So, hey, if I if I ask you guys, well, here is a function which uh, assigns season to months. What is wrong with it? Then um, you have to say, well, um, this doesn't convert the months; it converts the days. Um, so, but it'd be able to answer questions about the different idioms that we uh, that I showed you guys today. All right, then for me, there's only one thing left to say, and that's good luck on the exam. Um, of course, next week we will have the Your Own Choice lecture, which will be totally in the style of um, Pandemic Edition 3. So the way that we're going to do the lectures next year. Um, and I wish you all very, very Good luck on the exam. Like I'm hoping that everyone will pass in one go and that everyone gets a 1.3 or higher. Um, that would be the ideal situation for me because then I don't have to do any re-exams. Um, be aware the exam is long. There will be 42 questions. Um, so make sure to just continue working. If you don't know one of the answers, just skip it for now and just go to the next questions because there will be a lot of questions. Also be aware that there will be a drawing question. So there will always be a drawing question related to my birthday. All right, so any remarks, feedback so far? Did you guys like the course? Did you hate the course? Um, do you feel that you've learned something? Are you feeling more confident about programming in R? Like any and all feedback is welcome. Um, if you say, don't stream from Holland again because the audio is just horrible, then that's also feedback. So um, 
It's up to you guys what you want to see. All right. One question, are we going to write the exam on a paper or on a computer? So you are going to write the exam on paper. You are going to photograph the papers and then send them to me when the exam is over. And then you will take your papers, put them in an envelope and send them to me physically because I do need to have the physical exams in the end. Um, so, but yeah, the idea is that you guys will be monitored via Zoom. And I will put the exam questions online. And then, uh, do you need to see my fingers on the cam? Well, no. No, I, 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 I don't know. Do I need to see your fingers on cam? I'm not sure about that, but... Uh, I enjoyed your refreshing teaching style. The assignments were too challenging for me. Maybe solving them together in a computer room in uni would solve this problem. Yeah, that I think is the main problem of the uh, online lectures. Normally what we would do, right, is we would be on, uh, on, on Thursday. We would start at two. Um, I would do my lecture like two hours and then we would have two hours of sitting together um, and working on the assignments. So generally, um, hey, you guys would split up into groups of two or three people, and, and then you can also discuss with each other. And that's the thing I think that is really uh, missing because now you're home alone and you have to do the assignments alone. You can't directly ask for help, um, which I think is, is a drawback to the digital system. But it's something that I can't really... Uh, solve right you're not allowed yet to enter the university although it might be now but um it, it it's one of these things that i don't um i don't like like the doing the the assignments together um no is referring to the question by my name is mousy i don't know perhaps she has very beautiful fingers and that's why she wants to show them on cam like it's it's not illegal to show them what is the reason for writing on paper i need to have a physical copy that's the only reason it's germany so i need to be able to have a physical thing so that in two years when people ask me like did this student really do the exam that i can pick up the physical piece of paper and show yes my name is mousy did the exam and here is the exam so that is why we're doing it on paper All right, any more questions? Um, last year we actually did a mock exam. Um, if people really wanna have like a mock exam where we try it. In my uni, they are using shiny formula thing for our exam. Yeah, yeah the, you can do a programming exam in many different ways. Um, this is just like the humble needs me to have a physical thing. And if I don't have a physical thing, then I need to have like, uh, because we, we are allowed to do oral exams, right? So in theory, we could have oral exams, but then I need to have a second graduator who is in the room and I need to have someone who makes a protocol. And then both me, the second guy and the student need to sign the protocol for it to be, it's just the Humboldt University. They, they're a little bit difficult when it comes to these things. Um, but of course, the nice thing about doing it on paper is you can also do the drawing. And drawing is much nicer on paper than it is on computer. Uh, this is Lebenswissenschaften. Of course, this is physical in a certain way, I guess. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I, that's, I, I, that's the only requirement I think that they have is that in the end, like I can give you your credit points when I have a physical proof that you did the exam and passed the exam. Um, but yeah, but if you guys want, we can, we can do a quick mock exam next week after the fishy data lecture. 
Um, then we just hop on Zoom for everyone who wants to kind of figure out how to do it. And then we just have like two or three questions that you guys can do and I can supervise and watch my He-Man things while you are doing the exam. I don't think any of you guys know how who He-Man is actually. I feel so old sometimes. Anyway, that's more or less how we're going to do it. So, and uh, that's why you also have two, right? You have two chances to do the exam. So we will also do the drawing by hand on paper, but, and not on R, right? Yes, yes. It will just be pen and paper. Um, you will just be sitting there answering the questions. And then the last question will be a drawing question. Um, so make a really, really nice drawing for me to decide if you're worthy to get the additional points. But yeah, it, it, in theory, it's just going to be a, a standard exam. It's just that it's not going to be in person. It's just I'm going to watch you guys via Zoom instead of walking past your desks and looking sneakily if anyone does the cheating thing. All right. Any more questions? Any more remarks? Any more feedback? Oh, I had an additional question slide. All right. If that's not the case, then um, thank you guys so much for being here and um, attending mostly of, of almost all of the 11 lectures. Like um, I see the same names come up a lot. Um, I will be very interesting to see you guys because you've seen me a lot, I think, like probably like 40 hours in total already. Um, so it will be interesting for me to see you guys. Um, and like I said before, I wish you the best of luck during the exam. And um, next week, be sure to attend the fishy, fishy data lecture because I spend a lot of time on it, making making it look really, really beautiful. And um, probably something like this is going to be the um, third edition of the lecture. So. Next year, it will all be in this style, I hope. If I get all of the slides transformed from what I have now to these kinds of, so it will be drawing and looking more beautiful, I hope. All right, then 4.48, we're perfectly on time. Um, thank you for watching and um, we will see each other next week and Otherwise, I will see you guys on the exam. So thanks for watching and see you soon.